माई डियर फ्रेंड्स आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू अवर चैनल बेस्ट नोट ट्यूटोरियल्स आई एम रोशनी शाह एंड आई एक्सप्लेन टॉपिक्स फ्रॉम डिफरेंट कोर्सेस विच आर गिवन इन द सिलेबस ऑफ एग्जामिनेशन सो ह्योर इन अवर लास्ट क्लास वी हैव लर्न नथिंग कैन डाई इन दिस पोइट्री विच इज रिटन बाय एल्फ्रेड लॉर्ड टेनिसन ही टॉक्स अबाउट इटर्निटी ऑफ नेचर एंड द प्रोसेस दैट इट हैज टू कंटिन्यू okay so in today's class we are going to learn poetry break 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 and uh, in this break 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 he talks about how he lost his friend and, and how it becomes difficult for him to remain with his memories only he wants his friend to come and give him hugs he wants his friend to be with him to talk and in his memory he remains alive but in physically so in this class we are going to do a comparison between nothing can die and break 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 and before we start with explanation let me tell you the biography of alfred lord tennyson then only we will move ahead and we will have a detailed explanation of the poetry please be patient i'm going to discuss in details about everything that alfred lord tennyson did in his life and uh, everything that is there in the poetry and uh, what readers had to learn from this poetry as well so please be with me and uh, before i move ahead i request you all to subscribe to our channel we are already 10k and we are about to be 11k and we require your blessings in order to proceed ahead thank you everyone if you require anything else from us do let us know thank you and all the best for your examinations alfred lord tennyson alfred lord tennyson First Baron Tennyson FRS He was born on 6th August 1809 and died on 6th October 1892 and he was a British poet Now friends you will say what is FRS so you should mark it it means fellowship of the royal society okay fellowship of the royal society okay and uh, this is the society which was created to acknowledge the contribution of poets okay and this is the award which is given which is given or uh, granted by the judges of the royal society of london okay you might be asked you might be asked in uh, mcq that what is the full form of frc okay frc then you have to write it is fellowship of the royal society and what is the location of this society london okay it's london and it is the society which acknowledges the individuals contribution who does substantial contribution to the improvement of natural knowledge remember it is given for the contribution or the enhancement of natural knowledge okay i'm writing in short natural knowledge now this natural knowledge includes like mathematics engineering science and medical science etc okay and uh, it was started in the year 1663 okay till 2019 it was of 358 years all right so another mcq's question is regarding its foundation date foundation year sorry so you have to say it's 1663 all right let's move ahead and another interesting thing is that in frs till now there are 8000 members out of this 1707 members are alive okay they are active now and uh, another very important and uh, pleasing thing is that it was awarded to isaac newton we know who is he right isaac newton was given this award and he was given in the year 1672 Okay he was the first person to receive FRS All right 
Next is Charles Darwin. He was given in the year 1839. I am not writing his name because he is not from literature. So, uh, he is not much important. Next is Michael Faraday. He was given in the year 1824. Next is Ernest Rutherford in the year 1903. Next person is Srinivasa Ramanujan Iyengar. And for uh, any Indian, it's proud to announce his name. Okay, he was given FRS, that is Fellowship of Royal Society, in the year 1800, sorry, 1918. Okay, and uh, his field was mathematics. Now, he was given this for uh, pure math. Alright, he, he did mathematical analysis, uh, number theory, infinite series, and continued fractions. So, it is a proud moment for Indian, that is why... I am including here. Apart from that, there is Albert Einstein who has been given this award. Okay, now without moving much to FRS, let's move to our topic today. He was the poet laureate during much of Queen Victoria's reign and remains one of the most popular British poets. Alfred has given us a lot of poetry which inspires us, which ignites a fire in us so that we think of doing something extraordinary. Okay, so that is why he is very popular. Popular and being renowned. Popular and renowned. These are two terms, okay, which has a different meaning. Popular, you are accepted by the public. Renowned, you are renowned because of your work. Your work is very nice, that is why you are famous. But popular means everybody has accepted the person. Okay. In 1829, Tennyson was awarded the Chancellor's Gold Medal at Cambridge for one of his first pieces, Timbuktu. Now, this Chancellor's Gold Medal at Cambridge is equivalent to prestigious award of Oxford University, that is Newdigate Prize, okay, in Cambridge we find Chancellor's Gold Medal and similar to this we find in Oxford University as well and that is Newdigate Prize, okay, Newdigate Prize. Now in the MCQ you might be asked that what is the equivalent to Chancellor's Gold Medal. Then you have to write Indigate Prize which is issued by Oxford University. Okay. And Arthur has received it for his work Timbuktu, for the poetry Timbuktu. Okay. Now what do you understand by the term Timbuktu? Here also you can get question. All right. What is the literal meaning of Timbuktu? Now, it means far away place. Far away place or distant place, which is unreachable. Okay. Now, literally, if you see this term, then you find the places which are away from our sight, away from our reach. Okay. Now, when we see it symbolically, it means imagination. Okay, our imagination is far away place which cannot be brought to our reality okay, or closer to us. That is why Timbuktu is an imaginary place which is unreachable. There is a vast rift. Okay, there is a huge rift between reality and imaginary world. So, this is the literal meaning of Timbuktu, far away place. Okay. He published his first solo collection of poems, poems chiefly lyrical in 1830. In the year 1830, he published chiefly lyrical poems. Lyrical means the poem which has a musical effect, okay, which is not written in blank verse. Alright, because in order to have a musical effect, it has to be in a rhymic scheme. It should have meter, it should have proper syllable, 
Okay. So, this was the collection of lyrical poems. Okay. Let us move to another point. Claribel and Mariana, which remain some of Tennyson's most celebrated poems were included in this volume. Okay. In this volume, it was Caribel Mariana, which was included. Now, what is Caribel? I'll tell you. It is Claribel and Mariana, which remain some of Tennyson's most celebrated poems, were included in this volume. I'll tell you what are these two poetry is all about. Okay, although decried by some critics as overly sentimental. His verse soon proved popular and brought Tennyson to the attention of well-known writers of the day, including S. T. Coleridge or Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Now, decried. Decried means to denounce, Okay, not to give importance. All right. Now, many of the critics had denounced, okay, they had ignored the work of Alfred Lord Tennyson, but people received it. Okay, when people read, they could connect themselves with the poetry and then gradually, they, uh, you know, the poetries became very famous. All right, because of the sentimentality of the poetry, he became close to the heart of the readers. Okay, and this is the want of the poem. Okay, however good the work is, it won't be famous unless and until it reaches to the public, it reaches to the audience, it reaches to the readers. Okay, it's like uh, writing a song. Okay, the words are wonderful, the rhyme is very good, but it is not understandable to the readers or the listeners. What will happen? The song will go in vain. Okay, the task of the writer, the task or the hard work of the musician will go in vain. Okay, so what I mean to say is that whatever work the artist creates, be it a poet, be it a writer, okay, it should be connectable. Okay, it should be reachable to the public. Then only it will be famous. The same thing has happened here in Tennyson's poetry as well. When he wrote the poetry, it was not adequate to the requirement of critics. Okay, but it was according to the will of the readers, so he gained popularity. And at the same time, it reached to Samuel Taylor Coleridge also. We know who is he. He is the initiator of Romantic period in the collaboration of William Wordsworth. Okay, S.T. Coleridge, then William Wordsworth, Blake, all these are uh, first generation poet of Romantic period. Okay. So, here we find popularity of Alfred Lord Tennyson's poetry. Tennyson's early poetry with its medievalism and powerful visual imagery was a major influence on the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood. Okay? So, Tennyson's early poetry with its medievalism, there was something classy in the poetries of Tennyson. That is why it was powerful as well and another thing was that it was visual imagery with the help of words we will be able to imagine the scenario that poet wants to explain or the poet wants to reach to the audience okay through words it is candid clear all right and it has Im been implemented through visual imagery okay because of visual imagery, it had gained major influence. It was able to influence people because through when they are reading the poetry, they are imagining there is some scene which is going into their mind. And that image, that, you know, uh, the uh, story that they have created in their mind, it's so vivid. Okay, it's so vivid that they are totally engaged in that particular poetry. So, this was the characteristic of pre-Raphaelite or the poetries of Alfred Lord Tennyson. Okay. What is pre-Raphaelite? I'll tell you. Now, apart from this, let's 
talk about the some of the poetries which are extremely important and uh, which he has written in such a manner that so that it had become worldwide active poetry till date first is break 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 next is the charge of the light brigade then tears idle tears then we have crossing the bar okay all these poetries are heart touching that is why we have not forgotten the world has not forgotten his contribution yet now let us discuss what are there in break 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 the charge of the light brigade tears idle tears and crossing the bar okay let me tell you a little summary of all these four things let's move to the next point much of his verse was based on classical mythological themes such as ulysses although in memoriam ahh was written to commemorate his friend arthur hallam a fellow poet and a student in trinity college cambridge after he died of a stroke at the age of 22 so here we get to understand that he had used mythological themes okay it's also pronounced in another way that is mythological mythology is also correct mythological is also correct or mythological is also equally right okay so here we find that in his poetry there is inclusion of classical or a greek mythology and because of which we find interesting themes in poetries like ulysses okay now except this he talks about ahh arthur hallam in this poetry in memoriam because he had died because of a uh, stroke at the very early age of 22 and attention wanted to immortalize the name of his friend ahh that is arthur hallam so he did so tennyson also wrote some notable blank verse including ideals of the king ulysses and pythonus now some of the uh, as i have already told you that most of the songs most of the poetries were in sing song manner or musical effect was there in all the poetries but here it was not so it was ulysses and pythonus which and uh, ideals as well these three things did not have Uh, any rhyme scheme that is why these three were in blank verse maybe these are very long stories so the writer required to use blank verse in order to narrate the story okay because if he will try to maintain the rhyme scheme then it might not give such a uh, grace and effect which the poetry requires that is why he switched to blank So friends after knowing Alfred Lord Tennyson's biography we are going to move towards his extremely crucial work that is break 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 now let us see what is the content in it and why it has become popular poetry of Alfred Lord Tennyson let me read out the poetry and then i'll go with the explanation break 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 o thy cold gray stones o sea and i would that my tongue could utter the thoughts that arise in me o oh, well for the fisherman's boy that he shouts with his sister at play o oh, well for the sailor lad that he sings in his boat on the bay and the stately ships go on to their heaven under the hill but oh for the touch of a vanished hand and the sound of a voice that is still break 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 at the foot of the crags oh see but the tender grace of a day that is dead will never come back to me This poetry was first published in 1842 and 
This happened after nine years of the death of Arthur Henry Hallam at Vienna, Austria. Arthur Henry Hallam was intimate friend of Lord Tennyson and in his memory he writes in memoriam poetry. That elegy, here elegy means a poetry which mourns someone's death. That elegy sets forth at full length and with ample elaboration the sorrow with this exquisite lyric expresses in quintessence. So here the experience of poet is being shown and he compares the sorrow with the sea, especially the water which is splashing at the rock which is at the bank of the river. The rocks are quiet and the wave which creates a lot of confusion while arriving to the bank, it becomes quiet when it strikes with the crag. So this emotion is being expressed. He has a lot of emotion which is taking place in his heart and mind. He wants to pour it out but being an adult, he is not able to cry. He is not able to speak to anybody as well. The expression remains in his heart and it becomes unbearable for him. It was composed in a Linko Linshire Lane at 5 o'clock in the morning between blossoming hedges. Blossoming hedges means the hedges, the plants which are planted for embarkment. You must have seen in garden the plant grows in this way. Okay, this is called hedge and blooming means the hedge it was growing. Now let's find out who was Arthur Henry Hallam who had become intimate friend of Alfred. Arthur Henry Hallam Arthur Henry Hallam was born on February 1st 1811 in London, England. He died on September 15, 1833 at Vienna, Austria. He was well known as an English essayist and poet who died before his considerable talent developed. See friends, he died at very early age because of that his talent was not able to bloom properly. His talent remained latent. Uh, it was not shown, it, it didn't come out to the public in a fullest manner. He is remembered principally as the friend of Alfred Tennyson commemorated in Tennyson's elegy in Memoriam. So in Memoriam, he talks about his friend Alfred, sorry, he talks about his friend Arthur Henry Hallam because of which a new life was given to the memory of Arthur. Hallam was the son of English historian Henry Hallam. Even though he was son of his historian, he had interest in English. He met Tennyson at Trinity College, Cambridge in the year 1828. Friends, you must remember all these dates for your examination and the place as well where Arthur and Alfred met, where they joined together artistically and politically progressive students in the club called the Apostles. Here, what is Apostle? What is the Apostles? It might be asked in your examination. You have to write it is artistically, who had artistic inclination and those who had political progressiveness, sorry, they were engaged in a group called Apostle and even these two friends engulfed themselves into it. Hallam defended Tennyson's early work, poems, chiefly lyrical 1830, in a review for the Englishman's magazine and was engaged to Tennyson's sister, Emily, in the year 1832. See, Alfred Lord Tennyson had utter faith in Hallam, therefore he chose him for his sister, Emily. Otherwise, he would not have believed in this relationship but he had faith that is why Emily and Hallam were together and they were engaged in the year 1830.
32 after 4 years of their meeting. Hallam's prize winning essays and critically acclaimed poets, poems were collected and printed posthumously by his father. Posthumously means after his death. After the death of Hallam, it was published by his father, the historian Henry Hallam, in Remains. This is the name of the book where we find verses of Hallam. In verses and prose of Arthur Henry Hallam in the year 1834. In this year, his book was published and here we find all his essential works. Now let's move towards the explanation of the poetry. The poet expresses the all-round joy witnessed by him on the Clevedon beach. Now here, the poet is sitting and noticing the things which are happening all around him. He remembers his childhood days when he was with his friend Arthur Hallam. The fisherman's boy while playing with his sister feels happiness and so he shouts merrily. Here, when he was sitting at Clavedon Beach, he found there was a boy who was playing with his sister and he was extremely happy to be with his sister and play joyfully. Now, the poet who was extremely sad, he notices that the boy has nothing to do with the death of his friend. That is why he is happy and he is very much engaged in his own life. He does not have any concern for the poet because poet is unknown to him and that is and in the same way his friend as well. His friend and the poet both are unknown to this the boy. That is why he is showing least botheration towards the grief of this poet. The fisherman's boy is happy with his sister and he has nothing to do with the sadness of the poet. The sailor also experiences joy and so he sings profusely. The sailor who is there in the boat, he has to carry out his journey. Okay, this is a cargo ship. Cargo ship means business ship. Alright, which transports the goods from one place to another. So, he is busy in making money for himself and his for master. Okay, for his master. So, here the death of the friend of the poet has nothing to do with sailor as well. In contrast with this jollity, the poet is sad because the remembrance of his dearest friend Arthur Hallam comes to his mind. So when he was there at Clevedon Beach, he could notice a boy who was playing there and another boy who was singing and playing with his sister and there was another boy in the ship who was singing profusely who was singing loudly being in the ship. So he remembers that he is sad, he is in grave situation, all right? But the situation outside him, it's so jolly, it's so happy and it is full of merriment. So there is contrast which is shown at this situation. Let's move ahead. He has no words to express his emotion. See, friends, the poet is thinking about his friend and he is becoming sad. Now, he is not able to express his intense grief at the loss of his friend Hallam. Now, he is so much surprised by the indifference of nature. See, friends, we need to understand out here that nature will Nature will never change. Okay, nature has to follow its processes and it will do that. Right from the inception of nature, it has been doing its work and it will continue doing in future as well. So, whether somebody is losing their parents, friends, relatives, it has no concern at all. The nature will keep on continuing its duty. That is what it does and it has no feelings at all for the loss of the poet's friend. He also says that majestic ships 
run their course in the usual way and reach the port of their destination now see even the cargo ships has no concern about the death of poet's friend whatever they did earlier they are continuing with that it has no changes it has no strikes it has no halting in their work so the nature has not stopped working even the cargo ships as well it means nature and men they have nothing to do with human sadness they will continue working only the people who are associated with the deceased person will have problems and they will be saddened by the situation and no one else let's move ahead the movement of the ships on the high seas is not the least affected by the death of hallam a youth cut off in the bloom of life so at very early age hallam was cut but even if it he's even if his death had happened at the very early age of life it has no effect upon the ship drivers while nature is supremely indifferent to human sorrow the poet is overwhelmed by the tragedy of his friend's death so nature has to continue with its work otherwise the world will not survive therefore nature is indifferent but it has made a great difference in the life of lord tennyson he keenly longs for the warm touch of his friend's hand to hear the music of his voice now the person who is deceased can never come back but he is longing to hear him he is longing to touch him he is longing to hug his friend but unfortunately death has snatched away the hand and silenced his voice forever unfortunately his friend can never come back he has gone very far away from him and he will never come back it is eternal truth the poet notices the sea breaking upon the cliff churchyard where his friend hallam lies buried and expresses the sorrow that fills his heart so this is the place where his friend has been buried and sitting there he looks at the sea and he sees that huge wave comes with a great commotion at the bank or the at the edge of the water but when it strikes with the stone it loses its sound the same thing has happened to poet as well he has lots of emotion in his heart but he is not able to express it in a front of anyone He sees the fisherman's boy playing merrily with his sister and hears the sailor lad singing in the boat. I have already told you the boy is happy and the sailor as well because they are busy in their respective life. He observes a stately vessel sailing majestically to their ports. They have to make money and they are doing that and they have no concern about his friend. These activities serve to awaken in his heart a keen sense of the loss which he has sustained by the death of his friend who is gone forever and whose voice has been silenced for all time. So by this we need to understand that whatever nature whatever harsh situation the nature shows us the nature itself is not going to heal that we have to heal it because the nature will never deviate from its rules and regulations or the processes only human being has to deal with the situation in a brave way they have to brave the situation uh in order to live for the life in a peaceful manner otherwise they will mourn they will be sad and the problem will will increase and it will not be a good sign for human health he is filled with sadness at the thought that the happy days he spent with his friend can never return so the person who has already gone he can never come back and he can only remain in memories and he himself cannot come back 
The picture is then widened out till you see the children laughing the shore and the sailor boy singing and the stately ships passing on in the offing to their unseen heaven all with a view of helping us to feel the contrast between the satisfied and the unsatisfied yearning of the human hearts see all these people who are shown out here is human being the boy the sailor boy okay the children who are laughing at the shore and poet himself but humans these humans are satisfied but the poet is not so there are two categories of people who are being projected here satisfied and unsatisfied the poet is unsatisfied because he wants the hand he wants the company of his friend more but then the song returns again to the helpless breaking of the sea at the foot of the crags it cannot climb not this time to express the inadequacy of the human speech to express human yearning but the defeat of those very yearnings themselves now see there is a cry for help in the heart of the poet but just like the waves he comes it emerges it takes its height but eventually it has to disappear it is not able to climb the cliff it means it is not able to vent out from the heart of the poet and he is not able to tell it to anyone so that he can be of any help he can be of any consolatory personality for him he is not able to say that thus does tennyson turns an ordinary seashore landscape into a means out now here through this seashore he is able to show his situation as well just like seashore he is also loses the words which expresses the which is unable to express his friend's loss friends by this we have completed the poetry i hope it was clear to you all now i would request you all to subscribe to our channel and ask for the required materials if you are lagging in any thank you everyone we will meet with another video till then take care study well